right, so it is 7.30. Like my father likes to say, it's 7.30 on the clock of the wall. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started with our Bible study on tonight. Um, we're going to ask uh, Pastor Hampton to pray us in, and then we will go ahead and get started with our lesson on tonight. Amen. Father God, we come once again on another Tuesday evening to study your most precious word. We just pray, Lord, that you would bless us and strengthen us, enable us to uh, come through the things that we have to face as we travel through this world. We recognize that you have been good to us, my Father, because we could not have come by ourselves. Amen. Thank you for these that are, uh, are here so far. And we pray that there might be others, but we pray for the entire family of my father, of the Emmanuel Purgate Baptist Church. We offer a prayer for Sister Hampton and her family, my father. We uh, know that she's lost her sister, and we just ask you to please, sir, put, them, put your arms around them and comfort them as they go you through know. this, the loss that they have, have, have been in. Guide us and lead us, most of all, through your word that we may be able to grow strong and be able to do the thing that you would ask us to do and yeah. be able to show the world, my Father, that you are still alive and that you're still in our heart. Guide the church and guide all that come in contact with us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Thank yeah. you, Father. Thank Amen. You. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. And thank all of you for joining in with us on today. We are on week 40. <laughs> week 40. We have two more weeks after this. And we will wrap up our, our lesson, our studies on uh, how to live this life. What is this life all about? What does it mean to live this life? What is my purpose? And how do I live a purpose-driven life? And we on today, we're going to have a discussion on the simple fact of how to live a purpose-driven life. We've gone through 39 weeks of discovering uh, why we are here, uh, what it is that we are supposed to do, what it is that we have been created to do. Uh, why is it that we are created in the ways that we are created? Why God made us the way that he made us? Uh, the purpose of what God has made us for. And we are going to tie all of that in uh, tonight. And we're going to discover uh, how do we actually live a purpose-driven life. Uh, we are uh, so glad that God loved us so much uh, that he, he made us specifically uh, so that we can serve him, we can love him, we can live for him, and we can uh, do all the things that he has done to us and through us. Uh, we serve a mighty God who loved us enough that he gave us the tools, he gave us the power, he gave us the, the ability and the opportunity uh, to not only share his love to the world, but to be an ambassador for him, to be an example to the world. Uh, not just how we ought to live, but be an example to the world to show the world that Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and that Jesus Christ is love. So living a purpose-driven life, um, one of the greatest examples uh, of our human journey in life, people can say, is King David. Uh, King David wasn't a perfect man. King David, he had his many flaws. He had his many faults. 
uh, King David, we know, had many wives. He committed adultery. He committed murder. And he did all kinds of things. But God still stated that David was a man after his own heart. Mm -hmm. And the reason why God stated that was because David had a heart to serve God. And it says in Acts 13 and 36, it says, For David served the purpose of God in his own generation. And that is what we've been called to do, to serve the purpose of God in our own generation. It, it is important for us to be able to not only to live this life in a certain way, but to leave this life in a certain way that we can, we can leave a mark on this generation. Not a mark in regards to a legacy for our children, not just a mark in regards to leaving a legacy on mankind in regards to philanthropy or uh, goodwill or our education or inventions or whatever the case may be. But we must also leave a mark on this generation in regards to building the kingdom of God, leading others to Christ so that they can give their lives over to him, so that they can experience the love of God, so they too will be able to have a testimony to somebody else that God is love, Jesus is real, and he is, in fact, Lord and Savior of our lives. Through these last 39 weeks, we've really discovered uh, what our purposes in life really are. Uh, we were planned for God's pleasure. We were formed for God's family. We were created to become like Christ. We were shaped and formed to serve God. And we were made for a mission. And because we know of these things, we know what our purpose in life is. Because we were planned for God's purpose, our purpose is to worship him. And we, we studied and we discovered that worshiping God is simply knowing God, loving God. Okay? If we know who God is, if we love God in every single aspect of our lives, that is worship. Because we were formed for God's family, our purpose is to belong. We are to belong uh, together to, to uh, form a bond, a relationship, not just with God, but with each other. And that's mostly done through our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ in church. Because we were created to become like Christ, our purpose is to grow in Christ. Every single day of our lives, we ought to grow closer and closer to God. Every single day of our lives, we ought to grow to become more and more and more like Christ. Because we were shaped to serve God, our purpose is to serve. To serve, which is our ministry. And because God is not here present on this earth, we, we, we cannot physically serve God, but we can serve God by serving others. Mm. When we serve others, we serve God, and that is our ministry. Because we were made for a mission, our purpose is to bring people to Christ and to go out into the world and tell the story of Christ, Jesus Christ's gospel. So this is our purpose. This is what drives us. This should motivate us. This is what we should live every single day for, to live a purpose-driven life. Okay? And there are five questions we're going to go over today. 
five questions that we ought to ask ourselves in regards to how we ought to live a life of purpose. And the reason why these questions are so important is because we are sometimes too busy. We, we, we are rushing back and forth, in and out, going to our jobs, taking care of our kids, cleaning, we're cooking, we're studying, we're doing all of these activities in our lives and we become too busy. Our minds become so busy that we begin to get stressed out and we're spending all of our energy on things that has nothing to do with God or with our purpose in life. And so we must ask ourselves ourselves these five questions in order for us to uh, uh, turn our lives back on the straight path on living a life of purpose. And so the first question that we ought to ask ourselves is this. It has to do with worship, our purpose of worship. What will be the center of my life? What will be the center of everything that I do? In other words, who or what am I going to live for? Who or what am I going to live for? For we must understand that whatever you center your life on is what you are going to worship. If you center your life on money, therefore you are worshiping money. If the center of your life is your children, then therefore you are worshiping your children. If the center of your life is your uh, your social status or your career, that you are worshiping social status or your career. Whatever you think about the most yeah. is the center of your life. I know when I was a teenager all the way up to my, I would say my early mid-20s, the only thing I thought about, only thing I thought about was as soon as I woke up in the morning until I went to bed at night and even sometimes while I was asleep, I was dreaming about it. The only thing I thought about was football. Football was the center of my life. Therefore, in those years, I worshiped football. I even, I even slept in bed with a football in my arms. I worshiped football. And then after football was over with, in a certain years of my life, what I thought about was females. <laughs> I worshiped females. So whatever you're thinking about mostly in your day, that is what you are worshiping. So therefore, we ought to ask ourselves, what is it that we are thinking about for most of our day? What is the center of my life? Whatever is at the center of your life is therefore the glue of your life. Your whole life depends on your center. And I know a lot of us, we love to, we have the, we have the fatuations and we have love or respect and we think a lot about our family or we're thinking about our spouses or we're thinking about our children or we think about our families, we think about our careers or we think about uh, our hobbies like golf or painting or whatever your love may be. Those are good things because those are gifts that are given to us by God, but they should not be the center of our lives. 
Because as soon as something goes wrong with the center of our life, our whole life breaks apart. If your career is the center of your life and you lose your job, your whole life falls apart. If your child is the center of your life and for some God awful reason, your child dies, your whole life falls apart. If for some reason your, 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 your spouse is the center of your life and your spouse turns out and turns around and walks out on you, your whole life is going to fall apart. If money is the center of your life and you and somehow you lose your money and you can't pay your bills, your whole life is going to fall apart. What I'm trying to say is there's only one thing that you can never lose in your life. And that is your relationship with God. So therefore, we must make sure that God is the center of our lives. The center. Digger Rattler, what does Psalm 62 and 10 tell us? <clears throat> 62 and 10 says, if your wealth increase, don't make it the center of your life. Yes. Yes. A lot of us, we think about money a lot. Each and every one of us uh, can testify to the fact that money is a big issue or a big topic in our lives. And the Bible warns us about the fact that if we start building wealth, if we start doing great in our jobs, we start having savings and all this stuff, these mass savings, and we start building, buying property and homes, and we start uh, gaining wealth, do not make it the center of your life. And the reason for that is material things will fade. Yeah. We cannot take wealth with us. We cannot take material things with us. They will fade. And if we make them the center of your life, once again, your life will crumble. I don't know if too many people know this about me, but uh, uh, when, when I was, uh, what was it? I think it was 21 or something like that. When I first began to get the calling, no, I was 20. When I first began to get the calling on my life to preach, okay, I had all, all kinds of savings. I was saving money. I had money on the side. I was doing pretty good, doing odd jobs here and there. I was pretty decent, for, doing pretty decent for myself. But as soon as I heard the first call, and I decided not to answer. <laughs> and I heard the second call, and I decided not to answer. Those savings, the money that I had saved, started to dwindle. And I started to sink into a little bit of depression. I didn't know what was going wrong with my life. I didn't know what was happening. Because I was putting the, the pride of me saving the money was above the calling that God was giving me. Do not put material things in front of God. We must understand that the greatest things in life aren't things. The greatest things in life aren't things. The greatest thing in life should be our relationship with God. This life that we're living in is preparation for our true home which is in heaven. Remember, we are just visitors here. This land, this world, this earth, this is not our home. We are, we just been sit here by God as ambassadors 
to be representatives of him, to be representatives of what heaven is going to be like. Okay. So therefore, we should uh, uh, make sure that the larger your, your core is, it should and it should have nothing but God in it. Because the larger your core becomes, the less the things, other things in your life become. The stress, the worry, the anxiety, all those things will shrink as, as God, as your core, strengthens. Jesus should not be a piece of your pie. You know, a lot of people, uh, they illustrate their lives as pieces of the pie. I have my family is a piece, my career is a piece, uh, my hobby is a piece, my, uh, and then we put God as a piece, my, my church life is a piece, my relationship with God is a piece, my children is a piece that we, and we say, well, that's the pie of my life. Well, Jesus does not want to be a piece of our pie. Mm -hmm. Jesus wants to be the center of our pie. He wants to be the filling that circumferences our whole pie. If our family is a piece of our pie, then Jesus should be the filling that helps our family life. If our career is a piece of a pie, Jesus should be the filling of that piece that helps us with our career and so forth and so on. We must make sure that we keep Jesus as the center of our lives. Okay. When Jesus is at the center of your life, Therefore, you are going to worry. In any aspect of your life, if Jesus is at the center of it, best believe you are going to worry. Best believe you are going to be stressed out. Best believe you are going to become over, you will be overcome with anxiety. That's why it's so important that whatever we do, whatever we uh, set out to do, Jesus is the center. And if Jesus is the center, no matter what happens, no matter what occurs, no matter what tragedy happens, we know and we have faith that God will prevail. God will overcome. God will get the victory in whatever happens in our lives. But that only happens if we keep him as the center of our lives. Because as soon as we put something else as the center, our lives will crumble. They will crumble and we will worry. We will stress. We will have anxiety. Sister Leola, what does uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 14 tell us? Instead of worrying, pray. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Yes, okay, that's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Instead of worrying, pray. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Dr. Davis, what does the scripture above that say? 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Christ's love has the first and last word in everything we do. Our firm decision is to work from, from this focus center. Yes. Everything in our lives should be on the focus of God and everything else falls into place. And if God is our focus, if God is our center, then we shouldn't worry. We should instead pray knowing that God will work things out. So therefore, if we know that we, our purpose in life is to worship, 
And if we know that we must keep God as the center of our life, we should ask ourselves this question. Are we going to be self-centered or are we going to be God-centered? In every single day of our lives, are we going to be self-centered or are we going to be God-centered? Are we going to let our opinions, our, uh, our thoughts rely on our own strength when we go through certain situations and circumstances in our life? Or are we going to sink our feet in the firm ground of Jesus Christ? Okay. So that's the first question. First question is the worship. What will be the center of my life? The second question has to do with fellowship, our purpose of fellowship. And the question is, what will be my community? What will be my community? God did not intend for us to go through life alone. Amen. He intended for us to go through life in a community, to be part of a body, to be a part of his family. And just like uh, a part of a body cannot survive, uh, detached from the rest of the body, it's the same as a child of God. A child of God cannot survive without being attached to God's family, which is the church. God formed us, he made us, he created us for us to go through life with the body of Christ. Why? Because we need uh, encouragement. Why? Because we need to see examples of how people have overcome some of their darkest moments in life. Why? Because when we fall into a, 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 a sense of rut or we fall by the wayside, we need people around us that can put our arms around us and pull us back into the forefront, pull us back into the love of God and show us that we need to walk this straight and narrow path. Without community, we are as good as done. Good as done. Reverend Pope, what does Galatians 6 and 10 tell us? Galatians 6 10 says, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Yes, yes. Let me see if she answers. Sister Mimi, what does Romans 12 and 5 tell us? <laughs> no, she's not going to answer. Romans 12 and 5 tells us, since we are all one body of Christ, we belong to each other. We belong to each other. And each of us needs all the others. It's extremely important, extremely important that we understand that we need each other. I cannot make it without you. You cannot make it without me. We need each other. What does the song say? I pray for you. You pray for me. We're all a part of God's family. We need each other in order for us to grow stronger and stronger in the Lord. Okay. Reverend Hampton, what does James 3 and 18 tell us? James 3 and 18. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with that lives right with God and enjoy it if we, you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. Yes, yes. 
this verse is simply telling us that in order for us to belong, belonging is intentional. It's hard work, especially dealing with us folk. <laughs> we all have different personalities. We have different characteristics. We have different morals. We have different uh, all everything is different about us. How we how we talk, how we take certain things. It's hard work to belong, but God says that is our duty. We must work hard to belong. Why? Because that is when we are at our strongest. Is we are if we belong in a community. So therefore, we must ask ourselves this question. Are we going to be a spectator or are we going to be a participator? Are we going to just sit on the sidelines? Are we just going to sit in the stands and watch while the game is being played? Or are we going to tug on the coach's uh, coattail and say, coach, I'm ready to come in and play? That is something we ought to ask each, each ourselves each and every day. Am I going to be a spectator or am I going to be a participator? Am I going to just go to church or go to virtual church and just listen and just take in what I can take in and that's it? Or am I going to have a desire to participate? Am I going to have a desire to do something that, that will strengthen the ministry? Am I going to have a desire to do something that will help the church reach other people's lives? Is there? Am I going to be a participator to the point where I am going to be a vital part <clears throat> to the body of Christ? So, in regards to our purpose of fellowship, what will be my community? And then in regards to our purpose of growth, the question is, what will be the character of my life? Who will be the character of my life? God is not concerned about our careers, he is not concerned about our comforts, but God is concerned about our characters. God couldn't care less if you are a president of the company. Mm -hmm. God couldn't care less if you have all kinds of material things around you and you are living lavishly. But what God really cares about is our character. How will people see us when they are around us? What will they think about us when they are around us? More importantly, will they see him in us when they are around us? Okay. How is our character? Deacon Rattler, what does Romans 8 and 29 tell us? <clears throat> Romans 8 and 29 says, far, <clears throat> far from the very beginning, God has decided that those who came to him to become black, his son. Yes. God decided that we should become like his son. Okay. God decided this. It wasn't our decision. Yes, we had to make the choice to, uh, uh, for Christ to come into our lives. Yes, we had to make the choice to accept the gift of salvation. Yes, we had to accept the choice uh, for us to uh, accept the love of God and what he has done for us. But God decided that we should become like his son. Therefore, 
we don't have a choice. We have been mandated by God to become like his son. Each and every day of our lives, we ought to work hard to become like his son. And I know that's not easy. Every single day, we are on this war path between carnal and spiritual and fighting every single day for the direction of our lives. But I pray that nine out of 10 times, 9.5 out of 10 times our spiritual overcomes our carnality. And every single day we become more and more and more like Christ. What does it mean to become like Christ? If God decided that we are to become like him, what does that mean? mean. Sister Leola, what does Philippians 2 and 5 tell us? In your lives, you must think and act like Christ Jesus. Yes. So to become like Christ, we must think and act like Christ. Amen. Pretty simple. Christ came he gave us the blueprint. He gave us the example. So therefore, every single day of our lives, we must think and we must act like Christ. But then the question becomes, how do I know how to think and act like Christ? <laughs> well, we must know these things through reading the word of God. It is the thoughts and it is the actions of Christ. That's all, that's all the Bible is. The Bible is the breathed word of God. And it tells us how God thinks, how God acts. It, the Bible tells us how Christ thinks and how Christ acts from Genesis all the way to Revelations, every single word that's in the Bible tells us how Christ thinks and how Christ acts. So therefore, we ought to follow that blueprint. We are like trees. Trees are uh, created to grow created to grow and from those trees it, it, trees produce fruit and the fruit that is grown from those trees comes from the very character of that tree apples grow from an apple tree mm -hmm. oranges grow from an orange tree lemons grow from a lemon tree The fruit that comes, that, that bears on that tree, matches the character of the tree. We are to be the fruits of Christ. So therefore, we ought to produce the characters of Christ. And just like uh, trees grow, trees grow from food, water, and fertilizer. We also should grow from food, water, and fertilizer. What is our food and water? Food and water is the word of God. Well, then if food and water is the word of God, then what is our fertilizer? We all know what real fertilizer is and what it's made out of. It's made out of mess. So our fertilizer is the mess that we've gone through. 
the mess that God has allowed for us to go through in our lives, the experiences that we've had to endure, we had to go through, that helps us grow. That helps us grow. Okay. So then, we know that character is developed by our choices. Our choices develop our character. We are faced with choices every single day, whether to go to the left or go to the right. And whatever choice we make is going to have an impact on our character. We must always do our very best to make the correct choice because it will develop our character or it will destroy our character. Okay? So therefore, we must start building our character right now, no matter where you are in your life, no matter what age you are, no matter how long you've been going to church, our character depends on our choices and we must start building it right now. It doesn't matter if you think you have the highest pedigree of character, you still must build on that character. Because if your character was 100% where it's supposed to be, God would have taken you home already. So therefore we must develop, we must build on our character and it starts right now. Deacon Love, what does 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7 tell us? Don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given. Complement your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and gen generous love. Yes. What, is that, what does that list sound like? The fruits of the Spirit? Where does the fruits of the Spirit come from? The character of Jesus Christ? What should we base our character on? The example that Christ gave us? So we must jump on the opportunity, jump on building our character based on the example that Christ gave us. So the question we should ask ourselves every single day, are we going to live based on comfort or are we going to live based on character? Are we just going to say, I'm comfortable, I'm good, I got what I need, I got what I want. I'm just going to live the rest of my life out and I'm just going to I'm just going to live the life or are we going to work hard every single day and declare I'm going to develop my character so I could be more and more and more like Christ the fourth question that we should ask in order for us to live a life of purpose has to do with our purpose of ministry. The question is, what will be the co contribution of my life? What are you going to do with the talents, with the abilities that God has blessed you with? Each and every one of us has been given a great ability, a great talent by God. We've already discussed in the past that each and every one of us is uniquely made by God. There's nobody on the face of this earth that has the same ability or the same talent as you do. Nobody on the face of this earth was made for the purpose that you were made for. So the question is, what 
are we going to do with those abilities, with those talents that God has gifted us with? What is our ministry? What is my ministry? My ministry is using my shape to help others. What is our shape again? Our spirituality, our hearts, the ability that God has given us, the personality that God has given us, the experiences that God has allowed for us to go through in our lives. That is the shape that God has molded us into. And we do our ministry by using the very things that God has given us to help others. Remember what our ministry is. We cannot serve God tangibly here on earth, but we serve God by serving others. And God has equipped us specifically for us to serve others. He's equipped us specifically to serve him by helping others. Helping others. Dr. Tasia, what does 1 Peter 4.10 tell us? God has given each of you some special abilities to be sure to use them to help each other, passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. Yes, yes. We're Pope, Ephesians 2 and 10. Ephesians 2 10 says, It is God Himself who has made us what we are and given us new lives from new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ago he planned that we should spend those lives or these lives in helping others. Yes, it is important for us to, that's why it's so important for us to understand our shape, to understand how God has molded us, because God is depending on us to use that shape Amen. and to spend our lives in helping others. Because truth be told, we were made to help others. We were made, we were formed to help others. Well, Pastor, I thought we were made to worship God. We worship <laughs> God by helping others. We serve God by helping others. Hummingbirds serve God by humming. Floating in the air in one spot and doing what they do. Deer help serve God by doing what deers do. Bees serve God by doing what bees do. Spiders, as much as I hate them, serve God by doing what spiders do. We serve God by doing what God has created for us to do, and that is helping others. Well, the question is, where can I make the biggest contribution? We can make a living by what we get, but we can make a life by what we give. Should I say that again? We can make a living by what we get, but we can make a life by what we give. So the question we should ask ourselves is, are we going to spend our time getting or are we going to spend our time in this life giving? Too many times we come to church expecting to receive, but we don't spend enough time in church giving. <clears throat> We come to church expecting to hear a word. We come to church expecting to hear from the choir. We come to church expecting to receive a blessing from God. We come to church expecting to leave better than when we came. 
we're 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 in the in the spirit of just get it, give it, give, 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 give me. But when we come to church with the spirit of giving, to give God his praises, to give God his due worship, to give God our all through our voices and through our prayers, to give God what he deserves through our sacrifice of tithe and offering, to give to God through our sacrifice of our talents and our abilities, we will get more out of the worship service. And the same thing in life. If we wake up every single morning expecting to give, a blessing. we will get more out of life. God will bless us even more if we spend our time giving instead of always taking. So that brings us to our final question. Our final question of, of how we are to live a life that is full of purpose. It has to do with our purpose of mission. And the question is, what will be the communication of my life? We have been made, we have been uh, uh, created we have been mandated, we have been saved to bring people to Christ, to go out into the world, and to share our life message. We ought to share our story, how we were delivered from what we've been going through and how we've been brought from our darkness into his marvelous light. We ought to share our story of how God looked down upon the wretched life, which was myself, and how he still loved me, how he still saw me as being valuable, how he still loved me enough that he turned my life around and he is still blessing me. Even when I don't deserve it, he's still blessing me. Even when I make mistakes, he's still blessing me. Even when I don't do everything I'm supposed to do, he's still the Lord over my life. That is the story that we ought to be telling and sharing to the world. That is our mission. That is the communication of our lives. It's not to tell people what uh, so-and-so did down the street or what this couple was going through in their, their marriage or to tell to do all these other type of things that we communicate about in our lives. We ought to communicate our life story, the gospel of Jesus Christ. First to let 1 Thessalonians 1 and 8 tells us, your lives are echoing the master's word. The news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You're the message. You're the message. And I like the word echoing. Your lives are echoing echoing the master's word. What is an echo? An echo is something that repeats the same thing over and over again. If you go on top of a mountain and you say hello, you're going to say hello coming back to you five, six times. If the same thing is going to be said over and over again. That is an echo. And sometimes when you share the word of God, you're going to have to say the same thing over and over again. Your, our lives, the way that we live our lives should be saying the same thing over and over and over again. 
every time we step out of our front doors and somebody sees us and sees how we live in our lives, the same thing ought to come into their mind. Why is she so happy? Where is that joy coming from? What is it that's in him that makes him act in such a, with such great character? What is that glow that I see in her? They should say the same thing every single time they see you because your communication of your lifestyle should be an echo. That's why I like the name, the Echoes of Emmanuel, which I'd mm -hmm. love to change to the mighty voices of the Echoes of Emmanuel because they sing the same message every single time they stand up to sing. It may be a different song, it may be a different melody, it may be a different leader that's singing, but the message is the same. They are echoing the master's word. And God wants us to use our shape to communicate God's message through our story. Because truth be told, actions speak louder than words. I can stand at the pulpit and I can, I can preach all through all of my suits and my shirts or whatever I decide to wear. I can sweat up a storm. I can become hoarse and I can faint and fall out and do whatever. But if my life doesn't show when I preach, that's all for naught. You can have the fanciest dresses. You can wear your, you can hold your Bibles. You can have your nose up in the air. You have the fanciest church hat. It doesn't matter if your life doesn't match. Action speaks louder than words. Philippians 1 and 27 says, live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. That you are a credit to the message of Christ. Have we asked ourselves, am I being a credit to the message of Christ? Is how I live in my life, is it a positive Am I adding on to the message of Christ? Am I showing the message of Christ? Or am I a damnation to the message of Christ by how I live? Acts 20 and 24 says, life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about God's mighty kindness and love. Our life is worthless <laughs> if we're not doing what God has created for us to do. So therefore, these five questions should always be in the front of our minds every single time we wake up. Am I worshiping him? Am I keeping God the center of my life? Am I in fellowship? Am I a part? Am I belonging to the community of God? Am I growing? Is my character, is the character of my life getting better and better? Am I fulfilling the ministry that God has for me? Am I contributing? to the ministry in my life? And am I fulfilling the mission that God had for my life? Is the communication of my life giving credit to the message of Christ? So in order for to live a life that's full of purpose, you may ask the question, well, how do I start doing this? How do I start? Well, we must live 
out the word. Plain and simple. We must live out the word. And we cannot live out the word unless we A, read the Bible, study the Bible, meditate on the Bible, and B, have a strong relationship with God. So every single day of our lives, in regards to us living a purpose-driven life, we ought to ask this question. Every single day of my life, am I promoting myself or am I sharing Christ? That will tell you if you are living a purpose-driven life. Am I promoting myself? Or am I sharing Christ? God has given us this chance, this opportunity in our lives to do what he has called for us to do. There is nothing else that God would rather us do than to live out a life of purpose. Because that's what he created us to do. He didn't create us to be CEOs and to be successful in our careers. It's a gift that's been given to us that he gave us the talents to do that. But that's not why he made us. That's not why he created us. It's good for us to have loving family, to have lots of children and be able to live a happy life, a comfortable life. That's not, how he, that's not why he made us. Those are gifts from God. That's not why he created us. He created for us. He created us so that we can fulfill the purpose of our lives. Sharing Christ to others <clears throat> by our voice and by with our lives. So I pray that uh, each and every one of us, uh, we've gone through 40 weeks now of trying to discover what our purpose in life is. And I pray that uh, we can now have enough information that we can start formulating what Christ really wants for us. And not only formulate it, but we can actually start living it. And we can grow stronger and stronger as individuals in God. But we can also grow stronger and stronger as a church body in God. So we can make a huge impact and a big difference in the community and the world that we live in. Amen. 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 Anybody have any questions or any comments that you would have you would like to say? It's okay, Deacon Love. <laughs> no? All right. <laughs> well, God bless each and every one of you. I'm so glad that you're able to come on on tonight and we can share together, we can grow together. Uh, I pray that all is well with each and every one of you and that God is continuing blessing you. Uh, we're going to be dismissed with the prayer. Let us pray for each other. Let's pray for our church family. Let's pray for all those who are still dealing with this COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, let's pray for my mother and her family. She lost her sister. And uh, let's pray for each other that we can grow stronger in the Lord. We're going to ask uh, Deacon Love to pray us out on tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have done uh, for us. And we uh, thank you for all that you have done to us. Uh, we know, Heavenly Father, that this is a journey that does not take 
uh, just a few steps. And it's a journey that takes an eternity. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for standing with us and leading and guiding us. Uh, Lord, it's not that we didn't know which way to turn. We did not know which way to go. Uh, we thank you, our Heavenly Father, for loving us. Uh, oftentimes, it's difficult for us to love ourselves. Uh, it's difficult, oh Heavenly Father, to live up to the expectations, not only that you have for us, but uh, the expectations that this world has for us is often uh, too difficult to bear. Uh, we thank you for the strength that you have provided so that we can continue to do the things that you've asked us to do. We thank you, oh Heavenly Father, for surrounding us uh, with loving hearts and spirits that uh, support us when we can't support ourselves. Oh, Father, this evening, I pray for those who have suffered loss and uh, who have suffered sickness and uh, who has suffered, oh, Heavenly Father, just um, uh, unease about the things that are going on. Uh, I know, Heavenly Father, that everything is in your hands. There's very little that uh, we can do to change our fate or uh, this life journey. Uh, I thank you, Heavenly Father, for being there when no one else is there, uh, in the early morning or the late night, when we're going through that valley of the shadow of death. When, oh, Heavenly Father, we're seeking your face, your word, your comforting spirit and heart, we thank you for uh, continuing to return to us with blessings and uh, hope. Uh, we ask that you continue to watch over our church, watch over the congregation, watch over all of those whom we love, watch over those who are the Father that may not be in there, but still are not outside of our care. We thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, for just everything uh, that is good in our lives. Continue to bless us, continue to be with us, continue uh, to strengthen all of us uh, this day and forever. These things we ask in the name of your son, my savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake, uh, we pray, amen. 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 God bless each and every one of you. And Pray that God continues to keep you and shine his light upon you. Have a great evening, and I'll see you on Sunday morning. Amen. God bless you. Bless you, Pastor. Bless you. Uh, Pastor. Pastor. Amen. And... Uh,